Amen. It's now time that we're going to dig into the Word of God. If you would stand with me. Thank God for all of you, the faithful that are here. I thank God for uh, my wife, for her continued love and support. Amen. I thank God for her mother who is here. It gave us a chance to go, to go out and hang out a little bit. Amen. Uh, her mother's downstairs with Zoe, so we thank God for family. Amen. Amen. Thank God most of all for his word comes to us today from the Gospel of Mark chapter 3. We have been in the Gospel of Mark studying the mind of Christ in the Gospel of Mark. So today we pick up at verses 20 and 21. Then I'm going to jump down to verses 31 through 35 in chapter 3 of the Gospel of Mark. It reads, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, but they said, He is out of his mind. Verse 31, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Jesus asked them, who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will, is my brother and my sister and my mother. This is God's word for us, the people of God. Thanks be unto God. You may be seated. I want to use this week the, the same topic that I used last week. So if you'd look at your neighbor and ask them, who's with me? Look at them again. Ask them again. Say, who's with me? Again, I used this topic on last Sunday. If you missed that part one of this, uh, you can pick that up on, uh, in the bookstore or you can pick it up on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can check out all of our messages. Who's with me? In the year 2012, the St. Louis Rams, an NFL football team, released a player who had been a star on their team. His name was Jason Brown, and he played the position of center. At one point, church, he signed a contract for $37 million. His picture appears on the screen. He played and started in almost every game over a five-year span in a portion of his NFL career. When he was released by the Rams, because of his skill set, he was immediately contacted by the San Francisco 49ers, the Baltimore Ravens, and the Carolina Panthers. These teams understood that, that this young man at 28 years old still had some skill left in him. But Jason Brown, when he picked up the phone, he told everyone no. Instead, church, he purchased 1,000 acres of farmland in his native North Carolina, and he became a farmer. Lord have mercy. Somebody say, what in the world? While he knew nothing about farming, he did know that many in his community did not have enough food to eat. So he went on YouTube, and he learned how to till the soil, and he named his farm the First Fruits Farm. He appears on the screen harvesting uh, sweet potatoes from one of his first crops. He chose this biblically inspired name, First Fruits Farm, because he donates the first fruits of every harvest to local food pantries. In 2014, he donated more than 100,000 pounds of food to local food pantries. When he made the decision to step away from the NFL, his agent told him, he said, you are making the biggest mistake of your life. He said he was leaving so much money on the table. But his response now is, I have never felt more successful in my whole life. And in an interview, in an interview he did on CBS, he said, not in man's standards, but in God's eyes. That's exactly what he said. You see, he, he had done something that, that caught the attention of the world that even caused some people to call him crazy. But he said, I'm not doing this for man. I'm doing this for God. When Jason Brown began to reevaluate his purpose, it caused him to move in a direction that not everybody agreed with. 
but he helped us to understand what walking with God really requires. Now, somebody here might say, if, if I had millions of dollars, I'd also help those in need. But my focus today is not on his financial ability, but on the condition of his heart. You see, he, he had a, a heart that was focused on God that wanted to change the world. And so my focus is really, what does it take to follow the Lord and what might come as a result of it? You see, regardless of Jason Brown's bank account, he demonstrated an ability to walk by faith. He recognized that walking with God may cause ridicule, but that the faithfulness of God is stronger than the foolishness of the culture. And if I can just tell, tell the young folks up here, you got to recognize that sometimes when you walk with the Lord, when you follow the Lord, people might not always be on your side. There, there ought to be somebody out here that can testify, that can say, you know what, I, I'm a witness that, that when you walk with God, some people might make fun of you, some people might laugh at you, but the faithfulness of God is stronger than the ridicule of man. And so as we turn to the text today, we, we find Jesus, after he has just chosen these 12 apostles, those who would change the world with him, Jesus continues to walk in his purpose, but what happens is he shows us what happens when you begin to walk with God. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you to quit your job and, and go start a farm somewhere, but, but I'm talking about this. Watch this. I'm talking about what happens when you really start reading your word. And what happens when you really start trying to apply the word of God to your life? What happens when you say, I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray? What, what happens when you say, I'm going to start forgiving the people who hurt me? What happens when you say, I'm going to start trusting God for my needs? What happens when you say, I'm going to stand out rather than just try to fit in with what everybody else is doing? When you make these kind of decisions, that's when you really find out who's with you. Turn to your neighbor say, who's with me? When you make these kind of decisions to follow God and, and really live out his word, that's when you find out who's on your team. But this text shows us there are a number of things that may happen. The first thing is this. It's interesting, church. When you really start walking with Jesus, some people might question your sanity. Turn to your neighbor and say, I ain't crazy. Come on, tell somebody, I ain't crazy. Y'all got to talk. I need y'all to talk back here with me, all right? I ain't crazy. The Bible says that, that Jesus and his disciples went into a house, but the crowd, they followed them. It was so large that Jesus was not even able to eat. His notoriety had grown. People were coming from all over to see him, but the Bible says his family could not deal with his ministry. They could not understand the impact that he was making for the kingdom of God, and they said to one another, he done lost his mind. I didn't make this up. It's right here in the Bible. It says, they said, we got to go and get him because he's crazy. You, you see, it's one thing if you just come to church. It's one thing if you just have a few Christian CDs that, that you put in your car every once in a while. But when you really start allowing the Holy Spirit to direct your life, when you really start making some decisions for God, there are some people who are going to look at you and say, you done lost your mind. Now, th th there are some folks, they might not even talk to you, but they're going to go and find some other folk and they're going to talk about you and they say, you know she crazy crazy right you know she lost it ever since she started going to Macedonia right you, you see you see th that's because the world is comfortable with Sunday Christians somebody ought to say amen the, the world is comfortable for folks with folks who say you know what I'm gonna go to church on Sunday but I'm gonna do whatever else I want to do throughout the rest of the week the world is comfortable with nominal Christians those who are believers only in name because they really don't challenge the world at all the world is comfortable with carnal Christians who say I'm gonna I'm gonna raise my hand on Sunday but I'm a while out on Monday I'm gonna cut somebody out on Tuesday I'm gonna be whoever I want to be on Wednesday the world is comfortable comfortable with those kind of believers but when you really start to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit some folk gonna look at you and say you done lost your mind 
See, the world, the world is comfortable with Christians who don't really live out your faith. But as soon as you start reading your Bible, as soon as you start trusting God in the middle of difficult times, as soon as you start saying, I'm only drinking water for the next 40 days, come on now, somebody's going to look at you and say, wait a minute now, it don't take all that. As soon as you, as soon as you start saying, I'm not going to have sex outside of marriage, as soon as you start saying, I'm going to live a life that honors God, somebody's going to look at you and say, you done lost your mind. And here's what God sent me to tell you. It's all right because it also happened to Jesus. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? He's saying, look at the text. The Bible is showing us this has happened to our Lord and Savior. There's some folks, when, when, when you told them about our fast, you said, they, you said I'm only going to drink water these next 40 days. They said, y'all crazy in Macedonia. They said, it don't take all that. Right? And sometimes when you start walking with the Lord, people are going to look at you crazy. Sometimes, let me, let me keep it real, sometimes you're going to have to ask yourself, am I crazy? What do you mean? I mean, after you, you really start applying the word of God to your life, and, and after you forgive somebody who hurt you, after, after you step away uh, from an ungodly financial deal that would have put some more dollars in your pocket, after you cut off some friends who, who everybody else thinks is popular, when you make that kind of decision, sometimes you're going to have to look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I crazy? Why did I just do that? I, I don't, maybe, 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 maybe this faith stuff comes real easy to y'all. But, but there have been some decisions I made in my life for Jesus where after I made them, I had to go find another Christian who could help reassure me that I did the right thing. I had to find somebody else. And I had to say, am I, was I crazy for that? Was I crazy for taking that step of faith for Jesus? Was I crazy for giving up that opportunity? Because sometimes even we go on wrestling. But am I crazy for, for making these kinds of decisions? But the Bible is clear that as soon as Jesus started walking in his purpose, even his own family said, you crazy. Now the deep thing, the deep thing, don't miss this y'all, the deep thing is that his mother Mary had gotten direct confirmation from the angel Gabriel before she gave birth to Jesus that you are going to give birth to the Savior of the world. That means Mary knew who he was. That means Mary knew what was coming down the line. But as soon as he started really living it out, Mary said, we got to go get this brother. Now, now you're saying, well, what happened? It, the, the reason is, it's one thing to talk about faith, but it's a whole nother thing to walk it out. And Mary, Mary was excited back when, the, when Gabriel came and, and finally broke it down to her. But when she saw what living out the gospel really looked like, she said, we got to go pick him up. He lost it. Here's what you must understand. The people that will question your sanity may not get close enough to you to understand your faith. I'm going to say it again. The people who question your sanity may not get close enough to you to really understand your faith. It's right here in the text. Look at what happens in verse 31. The Bible says that Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, but standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. They said, somebody go get Jesus. Now, watch this. It's not the case that they could not get in. Otherwise, the person that they sent in wouldn't have been able to get in. And so it wasn't the case they couldn't get in, but they didn't want to go in. So they stayed outside and sent somebody else in. But watch this. Remaining outside, they also missed the opportunity to see what God was doing through Jesus. As long as they were outside, they couldn't really see what God was doing in Jesus. And so they became conformed to their own perspective rather than being transformed by the renewing of their minds. Let me help you. I'm going to come down your street. Let me help you. There are some people in your life who have not gotten close enough to you to see what God is doing through you, but they will still make judgments about you. And so God sent me to tell you, don't get too worried about them because they on the outside and they're looking in trying to make a judgment about you. But you got to say, it even happened to Jesus. And so I can't worry about what y'all on the outside are doing because those those of us on the inside know that Jesus is worthy of our praise. This, this, this is what I call, this is what I call a vocational hazard. 
you, you've heard, some of you all may have heard of an occupational hazard. That means, that means that there is a possibility of something happening on your job, right? If you are a roofer, it is a possibility that you may fall off a roof. That, that's an occupational hazard. We don't want that to happen, but it's a hazard. If you are a miner, it's a possibility that you may get stuck in a mine because that's an occupational hazard. Well, Christianity is a vocation, which means it is a calling. Y'all, God is calling you to a different kind of lifestyle. And watch this. You might have a vocational hazard. What do I mean? That means somebody might call you crazy, but that's just a vocational hazard. Somebody might not want you in their group. That's a vocational hazard. Somebody might call you out of your name. That's a vocational hazard. But you got to make up in your mind, this job or this vocation is too important for me to get caught up in what everybody else says, for me to get caught up in what everybody else does, because I have decided to follow Jesus. Jesus demonstrates that, that when we start walking with the Lord, some folk might call us crazy. But secondly, here in the text, Jesus demonstrates that when we really start walking with the Lord, when we really start walking with him, you might have to redefine your inner circle. You, you might have to redefine who you kick it with. Can, can, I, can I show you? It's right here in the text. Jesus has just chosen 12 apostles. And part of the reason why he chose these 12, because he knew the folk who were already close to him may not fully understand the kingdom of God. So he said, I'm going to pick 12 who I know are going to be bowed it for the Lord. He picks these 12 apostles, and in verse 32, somebody comes in and says, Jesus, your mother and your brothers, they outside. And Jesus responds and says, who are my mother and my brothers? <laughs> Woo! It's getting tight up in here. He says, he says, who are my mother and my brothers? Jesus is saying, I'm about to redefine my inner circle. I'm about to redefine who I kick it with. Because if I'm really going to be serious about the Lord, I can't hang out with all the same people I've been hanging out with. This is where we get understanding on the mind of Christ. When we're talking about we have the mind of Christ, part of that means I got to redefine who I kick it with. Now, now, let me be clear. Jesus is not saying you need to disown your family. Don't, don't leave here. Pastor told me I can't even go over. I can't come over the house no more. Pastor B said, I can't, I can't roll with y'all no more. No, that's not what I'm saying. But, but Jesus is saying you got to reevaluate who will be part of your inner circle. There, there's some folks who you can, you can connect with, you can associate with, but you got to understand that the folks who I got on the inside of this circle, I, I got to be real careful. I, I got to be real wise because they might get me caught up in stuff that is not connected to my purpose. They might get me walking down the wrong road. And so I'd rather be surrounded by some people who have the same mindset I do. I need to be around some folk who got the mind of Christ. You, you, you may have heard the story about the eagle who was raised on a chicken farm. Y'all heard that story about the eagle? Eagle was raised on a chicken farm. He, he was raised among all these chickens, and so he learned how to walk like a chicken. He learned how, how to talk like a chicken, but, but he always felt like he had something more inside him. But, but he, he was around all these chickens, and so he just did what chickens do. Uh, one day, he saw some eagles flying overhead, and he said to the chickens around him, he said, I wish we could fly like them. All the, all the chickens that were around him, they began to laugh at him. <laughs> they said, we can't fly like them, bro. We don't fly like that. We, we, stay, we stay low to the ground. But he, he, he had something on the inside of him that said, and said I, think, I think we can fly. I think I can fly like they can fly. But, but everybody began to discourage him. And so he resigned himself to his fate that he would never be able to fly. But then over time, he kept studying these eagles that were flying over his head. And he said, you know what? I think I can fly like that. And, and one day he got to the edge of, of a cliff. And he said, he said, I'd rather try and fail than not try at all. It, what happened then? What happened then was that this eagle jumped off the cliff and he began to flap his wings and he realized in that moment that all the folk I've been around have stunted my growth. All the folk I've been around 
could not see my potential. All the folk I've been kicking it with were keeping me away from where God wanted me to be. And when he finally got closer to some other eagles, he said, I wish I had gotten up with y'all sooner because I should have been flying all of this time. The question is, who are you with that's stunting your growth? Who are you with that's stunting your growth, that's not allowing you to be who God has called you to be? Some folk don't want to see you grow because they aren't comfortable in you going any higher than they are. But you got to be around some folk who say, you know what? I want to see you go higher. I want to see you do better. I want to see you reach God's purposes for your life. Church, we, we, we know, we, we're wise enough we know how to pick a physical trainer when we, we need to get our workout game up, right? You know how to go find, you go to LA Fitness, you go find you a trainer when you need to get your workout game up. You know how to find you a financial advisor when you need to get your money right, when your cash flow need to get a little better. You, you know how to find you a stylist or something when you need to get your hair done, you need to get your hair cut. You know how to go, you know how to go to Bats Barbershop. You know how to go somewhere and get your, get your hair done, right? Amen? But what about who's on your team who can challenge your faith? Who's on your team who can step up your faith level? Who's on your team who can step up your spiritual swag? Because you got to be around some folk who are able to challenge you to be who God has called you to be. And I'm not talking about who's your pastor. I'm talking about who are your partners. Who are you calling when you can't get the pastor tooks, when you can't get the pastor B? Who are you calling? Who's going to be next to you when you need somebody to pray with? That, that's why some folk gave up on the fast. You in the kitchen pacing. You in the kitchen pacing. You 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 got a, the coke in the fridge and you pacing. You pacing and you you don't know what to do. You pacing and and you you go ahead and drink that coke. Why? Because you ain't had nobody to call. There got to be somebody on your team who you can pick up the phone and they can say you gonna make it. All we got is 20 more days. All we got is 10 more days. Let me pray with you. Let me talk to you. Let me sit with you. Let me come over. How about we go out? Somebody got to be on your team who can help you, who can read the word with you, who can study with you. Because if I want to be an eagle, I can't spend all my time around no chickens. If I want to be a lion, I can't spend all my time around no raccoons if I want to be a kingdom man I can't spend my time around fake brothers who don't love the Lord if I want to be a kingdom woman I can't be around some fake sisters if I want to be a faithful Christian then I gotta say like Jesus said who are my mother and my brothers who are they who are they Jesus said, I, I got to be around some folk who going to step my spiritual game up. This doesn't mean I, I disown my family, but it means I purposely spend the most time with those who are going in the same direction. I, I purposely spend the most time with those who want to honor God. When you really start walking with the Lord, number one, some people might say you're crazy. They might question your sanity. Number two, you got to redefine your inner circle. But thirdly and finally, the scriptures declare that you will receive reassurance that others don't experience. This is, this is powerful. This, this is powerful here in the text. You're going to receive reassurance that everybody else doesn't get. When Jesus' mother and brother come looking for him, he does not even respond to their request. He could have said, tell him I ain't coming out. I'm up in here teaching. Tell him I'm not coming out. But the Bible says he doesn't even respond to them. He does not even answer their requests. Why is that? Because those who are not willing to come close to him will not receive the benefits that his presence provides. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? So, so what they do is they stay outside, and Jesus says, if y'all going to be outside, I'm not, I'm not going to talk to y'all. He says, I'm going to pour into those who have decided to come in close. The Bible declares in verse 34 that Jesus looked at those who were seated in the circle around him, and he said, you're my brothers and my mother. <laughs> Woo! He said, whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. The powerful thing that we cannot miss here, church, is that those who are willing to be close to Jesus receive reassurance that others don't get. 
You see, in this instance, Jesus is saying, I, right now, I don't have a message for those who are outside. <laughs> he said, those who are outside, I don't really have, I ain't got nothing for you. But those who have decided to come inside, I'm going to pour into you because you are my mother and my brother and my sister. Jesus says to those who are inside, I want to give you reassurance about your relationship. You see, when you start walking with God, when you start following him seriously, there is reassurance and, and there are levels of his love and of his grace that you begin to receive that everybody does not have access to. That's why in theology, we oftentimes talk about common grace. Common grace is the grace that everybody gets. Everybody gets some grace, right? right? You talk about common sense, everybody ought to have some common sense. God says everybody gets common grace, but then there is prevenient grace or so this special grace. There is grace and revelation that is only available to those who know me. And Jesus says, if you come inside, I'm going to give you something special. I'm going to give you something everybody else don't get. But, but if you stay on the outskirts, you won't get the fullness of what God has for you. And so my challenge to us today, me included, is let's follow God close enough so that we get the special grace. We get the prevenient grace. We get the powerful grace that will change our lives that would change the lives of those around us. Can you imagine being in a room with the Savior of the world? His biological mother and brothers are outside, and he looks at you and he says, you my sister. You, you are my sister. You are my brother. His, his, his biological family is right there, but he says, you're my brother and my sister. He says, this is the deposit that those who really walk with God will receive. He says, I'm going to give you something that everybody else don't have. And I want to encourage somebody today that if you're really walking with Jesus, some folk might call you crazy. But the good news is that God can give you something that everybody else don't get. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Can you really, can you walk it out for us? Can you make it plain for us? Here's what I want you to understand, that when you begin to walk with God, he says to us, I'm going to give you joy in the middle of your sorrow. He says, he says, he says, you know what, even though you're in the middle of a troublesome time, I'm going to give you joy because when you walk with me and you get close enough to me, I'm going to pour into you things that everybody else don't have. And so even though you're going through a hard time, even though you're going through a difficult season, God says, I'm going to give you something that's going, that's going to wow everybody else around you because they're not going to understand how you can have this joy in the middle of sorrow. He says, I'm going to give you peace in the middle of a storm. I wonder if there's anybody here who's ever been through a storm in your life. You were in a storm and you were going through, didn't know how you were going to make it, but then all of a sudden you felt a peace in your body. You felt a peace in your mind and you said, I don't even know where this is coming from. But then you step back and realize it's got to be Jesus because God says, I'm able to give you something that everybody else won't have. There are to be somebody who's been in a hopeless situation but God said I'm going to give you hope even though everybody else may not get it even though everybody else may not have it I'm going to give you something that everybody else doesn't get because when you come inside I'm going to pour out let me let me let me help you. I was I was in college. In college, I, I had a an eatery on campus. An eatery on campus. It was called the castle. It was a place folk loved to go to the castle. It was in the basement of one of these dorms on campus. And I, I went into the castle one time with one of my friends. We went in and we went in that the menu was posted up on the board. It was a, a large menu. They had all kind of cheese steak, all kind of uh, cheese fries, all kind of stuff that wasn't healthy for you. We was loving it down there, right? And so we go into the castle and, and we go in there and I make my order and then my friend makes an order and I said, that's not on the menu. He made an order and as soon as he made the order, the person behind, the, behind the, uh, the, the cook said, I got you. And I looked at him and I said, wait a minute. I said, I said that's not on the menu. I said, how you, how you know to order that if it's not on, if it's not posted up here on the menu? I said, how you gonna order that? And, and he said, he said, just because it's not listed up there doesn't mean it's not available. Now, I need y'all to hear this. I need you to get this. <laughs> what he was saying was, I've been coming here long enough, and I know the folk here well enough 
that I know that there's some things on the menu that everybody else don't have access to. There are some things on the menu that you got to be coming here long enough, that you got to be close enough to the folk to know you can place that order. There's some things on the menu that everybody's not aware of. And what God says is when you get close enough to me, when you've been walking with me long enough, when you really learn how to trust me, the menu opens up. There are some things that everybody won't have access to, but I'm going to give you some things on the new menu. I'm going to give you clarity in tough decisions. I'm going to give you strength in exchange for weakness. I'm going to give you light in the middle of darkness. I'm going to be your song in the midnight hour. I'm going to give you joy in the middle of sorrow. And I'm going to give you peace in the middle of your storm. I need you to understand today that there's some things you're going to face. There's some things you're going to go through where you're going to need some extra power. But Jesus says, if you know me for real, if you walk with me for real, that's on the menu. If you walk with me for real, grace is on the menu. Love is on the menu. Joy is on the menu. Peace is on the menu. He says, I'm going to open the menu up so you can have what others may not have. That's why the hymn writer wrote, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. That, that's why David said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He said, I've been with him long enough to have tried some other things on the menu. That's why Ty Tribbett said, you're everything to me. He said, I've been with Jesus long enough to know he's got more on the menu. That, that's why Uncle Reese said, we go hard in the paint when we worship because there's more on the menu. When I really begin to worship God, that's why the word of God reminds us that when we trust him and we lean not on our own understanding, in all our ways acknowledge him, he will, he will, he will direct our path. He says, if you're close to me, if you really trust me, if you really walk with me, I've got more on the menu. If you really walk with me, I want to pour out in your life more than you ever could imagine. But when you do that, some folk might call you crazy. Some folk might not agree with the decisions that you make. What you mean you, you're going to church again? What you mean you're going early to be involved in ministry? What you mean you, you're giving of your, of your paycheck for the ministry of the Lord? You, you crazy. But God says some of the things that we'll do might seem crazy to others. But the good news today is that we'll receive the reassurance. We'll receive the power that some others won't receive. I don't know about you, but I want to serve a God like that. Come on, who's with me? Well, anybody willing to serve a God like that? Who says, I've got more in store for those who will walk faithfully with me. Simple song today says, God, I want to hear what you hear. I want to see what you see. I want to speak what you speak. That's the kind of faith I want to have. Because I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we pray, right? We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we desire. I want you to allow this word to, to soak into your spirit as we sing these words. I want to see what you see. I want to hear. I want to hear what you hear. I want to hear what you hear. And I'm going to speak what you speak, God. I'm going to speak what you speak. Declaring your will in the earth. Declaring your will in the earth. As it is.
as it is in heaven. I want to see, I want to see what you see, God. That ought to be the cry of all of our hearts. I want to see. I want to see what you see. I want you to open my eyes, oh God. I want to hear what you hear. And I'm going to speak your word. I'm going to speak what you speak. Declaring your will. Declaring your will. 